Yeah. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. Uh, the reason why we're truncating the meditation this morning is to answer a, uh, a very important question that was asked uh, of me. And uh, you'll see what the, uh, the question is. And to answer the, the question definitively, uh, we have to, uh, it's going to take a, we want to answer the question definitively. And I think it'll be intriguing for you as well. So let me share the question with you. And uh, you'll see what we're talking about. So we'll do a screen share. So this is the uh, a tomb that is being referred to as Niang Niang Kunum and Kunum Hotel, and uh, you'll see how we treat the, that as we go through. And in this tomb, there is a a certain depiction that has caused. Uh, discussion and to your far left here uh, firstly on the bottom this is me inside the tomb the, so the tomb we're going to call it that for now and i'm examining this this panel <clears throat> so i put this here because to answer some of these questions, you have to you, know, you have to you know you know have a, a certain authority. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you have to uh, you have to know what you're talking about. So you have to go and investigate. And uh, and actually, I went into the tomb before the question was asked. Uh, but the tour guide that we were with brought up the issue as well. Uh, when Mina Sarma went, and she was the one that took these pictures while I was walking around, uh, looking at things and examining. And you can see up here, you see two male figures, and they're very close together, and they're holding each other, and they are, their noses are very close, and they're almost touching their lips. And over here, you can see the almost the same. They're very close in posture, holding each other. And down here as well, you can see they're they're very close together. And they're two men. And the question was asked: Is this an example of homosexuality in in ancient Egypt? And from this website, it says. Uh, the relationship between the two men is not clear. Egyptologists consider it problematical. Are they brothers? Could they be twin brothers? Are they close friends or are they lovers? Are they all of the above? A reasoned argument can be made defending any and all of these positions. And we'll go through and see if that is true. In the bottom, the best known case of possible homosexuality in ancient Egypt is that of the two high officials, Nyang Ang Kunum and Kunum Hotel. Both men lived and served under Pharaoh Neusere during the fifth dynasty, 2049, uh, 2494 to 2345 BC. And, and, and I would, uh, the dates I think are, are, are probably problematical <laughs> as well. Uh, so let's, let's uh, investigate and try to answer 
approach these questions and answer these questions and see what we come up with. And so uh, last year, November, someone asked me and they sent me photograph, a photograph of this. These are photographs, as I said before, were taken while we were there by Osarma. But they sent me a photograph of this. And they sent me a, uh, a translation that someone had done. Uh, and in that translation, they were saying things like, the, you know, they were lovers, they were brothers, they were manicurists, et cetera. So let's see if those things are true. So let's stop this screen share. And let's go to another screen share where we're able to look closer and examine this issue. And if everyone can mute, uh, that would be appreciated as well. Don't. So we're going to use a 360 from the Egypt Exploration Society. They did a good job of, of uh, documenting the tomb in 360s. So let's take a look. So, outside. so firstly, when we came here, we walked down these, this uh, flight of stairs and then we walked into it. And the, uh, you can see the, the enclosure wall. Parts of the tomb are built into the, the, uh, the rock, the solid bedrock. Well, part of it is built up. Uh, in the front. And that's so you walk down these stairs. And this area is in this, the area of Saqqara, where the step pyramids are, and where you find the, uh, the complex uh, of the pharaoh. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> And so it's a it's a a kind of a an old kingdom construct. So it's a very it's not so from from a very ancient time. So so around the time of the the pyramid text. And so it's very close to the area of where the the pyramid of Unas, pyramid of Pepi, Teta are that contains the pyramid text. So let's walk in. And so we walk in and you come through this door. And we're going to walk past this corridor before we start our investigation. I'm gonna walk past here. We will make a right. Walking in. Now we're going to turn left and now start to enter into the area. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to do is going to stop here at the entrance into the, the tomb area. And the reason why is because this inscription on the doorway on both sides tells us what is occurring or what is to occur on the inside of this room where you find the inscription that is in question. But we're going to read what's above the architrave because this inscription is a synthesis of this longer inscription. 
so it's more concise, more to, to the point. So let's get closer and let's do some reading. I was going to originally, you know, set it out and do a presentation on Eclipse, but it would make the presentation too, uh, too long. And we want to get to the point. We want to answer the question. So it says here, bird ah and bird adi, suit, hank, bird s, shitao, kunum hetet. And before we begin, this symbol is what is being used to mean a manicures, but let's see if that's true in this context. So the great house uh, through this, through the, uh, so Adi is the phonetic and this symbol, which is like a, a hand with, with nails coming down is what is being referred to as a manicures. Uh, this symbol is a determinative and always the, the phonetic is giving an indication of what this determinative mean in certain words when you look at this determinative. So offhand, it makes sense to say manicures, et cetera. But in a, in a context of the total whole of the inscription, what it means is that the person is going through a shaping and a polishing of their personality. Something is being done to make a, a, a final shining of the personality. Like let's say you go and you take your car to a detail shop and, and the final wax is, is what is shaping and polishing and making to shine the personality. So that's what's going on is the, the shaping and the shining. So by way of the great house, there is a, a shining polishing of the of him presented hang to this personality heard her is the chateau it, it, to cause the secret as chateau to cause the secret so he's being presented with the secret mystery kunum hotep of joining with the union of opposites. So this is a great house by which through the final polishing or the polishing of the personality takes place. And within here, the personality is being presented with the, the, the cause of the secret that brings about the union of opposites. And that's why he is referred to as Kunum Hotep. So in other words, it's not a name per se. It can be seen as a name, but what is really going on is that it's a moniker of a, of a, a mystical process that's taking place within the personality. Now, what does it say on the other side? Bird A M Bird Ari Sud Eng Bird S Shetao. Kunum and Ang. So the proper way of pronouncing this per the, the name is Kunum and Ang. And again, by this great house, this personality being polished and shaped and brought to a luster. What is being presented is the cause of the secret mystery of joining with the mystery of life. This is referred to as Kunum and Ang. And right below the architrave, as you walk in, it says the process that is being done, kunum and an kunum hetep, joining with life, joining with the supreme union of opposites. 
and you'll see why I say the supreme union of opposites as we go in. So now we know what is happening. Now we know that they are being presented with the instruction of the secret mystery to join with life and to join with union of opposites. So let's walk in. So you walk in and let's take a look at, because this is very important to the final determination. See these people, all of these people are priests on the walls to the doorway that we're walking in. And we know they're priests because it says it here, Kahem, Kahem, Kahem. So, the, you know, Ka of the priest, the, the priest of the Ka. And they're carrying ritual elements. They're carrying, uh, they're carrying things that they're going to turn into offerings. So they're bringing all this stuff in to the great house to make the, uh, the offerings that are going to be presented and they're on both sides. And they're of varying ages, some are younger. Here's a, an older, older gentleman. Here's a, a younger gentleman. But they're all priests. Now, as we walk in, walk to the center, and we make a right, and now we're looking towards the west. And here is the inscription, and here is the, the panel in question. We see the two of them together, their noses very close, and their lips almost touching. These people, that are commonly referred to as their children are actually priests. And you know by the term priest is here, him, him, ka. So these are priests actually. And there is a, and uh, an allusion to them having sons, but that's a different issue that we'll discuss at the end. So this inscription tells what they're doing, or what is what is occurring, what is happening. So it says, bird a uh, s hedge adi with the same determinative again. A suit, direct, konum hetep, mes et. So the great house, which is the cause of the illumination by doing the polishing, the cleansing, the, the bringing to luster, him and wisdom. Now he has the wisdom and the knowledge of joining the wisdom and the knowledge of joining with the union of opposites has been born in him. That's what it says, mess up, has been born in him. So in here, you, you, you uh, on the outside, it tells us that you're coming in here to gain the secret mystery. And here is telling us that that secret mystery has been born in him, meaning that he has actualized it. He has discovered that mystery of how to join the union of opposites within himself. And then, so what does it say on the other side? Here. So again, bird a suit, reg, I'm sorry, bird a s, hedge, ari, Sud Rek Penum and Ankh Mes Eth the great house that caused the illumination through the process of the cleansing and the polishing. And now he has the wisdom and the knowledge of how to join with the mystery of life. That knowledge of how to join with the mystery of life has been born in him. 
So they have actualized the teaching. And so not philosophically, but metaphysically within themselves. And so what is the process? What is the outcome of having that mystery born within you? For that, you have to go deeper into the structure to find out what the outcome of that is. So you come in here and you have to, let's go to the center of the room. You go to the center of the room and then you have to turn around and now look towards the east. And the, the east and west is, is the, the reason why they're using east and west, you'll see is a mystery in and of itself. And so here you see them again with their noses together and their mouths almost touching. So this is uh, what is referred to technically as a transposition, meaning that this, the whole teaching of this philosophy cannot be known by the, the, by the other wall alone that we were looking at, looking towards the West. Now we have to look towards the East and see what is being said here. And then you join those two and you come up with the, the answer of what is the outcome of having the birth of joining with the not <clears throat> the birth of the knowledge of the joining with the mystery of life and joining with the union of opposites, what that brings about. So for that, you have let's go to the inscription and see what that says. It's bird R S edge Adi. Amaku rek neter a kunum hetep. So, great house cause the illumination through the polishing, the cleansing, the the shaping of this person who is now venerable. Oops. Let's go back. who is now venerable, Amaku, is in the presence of the great divine, Kunum Hotep. So now he's in the presence of the great divine and that's what that mystery brings about. So what does it say on the other side? So Kunum Hotep is in the presence of the great divine and that's only one one piece because how it's written, it's saying that he is in the presence of the great divine and he is the great divine. And you'll see why it says that in a moment. But before we get there, let's read what it says on the other side. Bird A, uh, S, Hedge, Ari, Amaku, uh, Netara, Kunum and Ankh. So the great house uh, where the shining, the illumination of the personality, and the illumination means a, a spiritual realization, a depth of spiritual realization that is brought about by the shining and the shaping and the polishing of the now who is venerable, the great divine, a kunum and ang joining with life, the great divine kunum hata joining with the union of opposites in the presence of the divine. So a joining with the mystery of life in the presence of the divine, the great divine, the union of the opposites in the presence of the great divine. So who is this great divine that they are in the presence of? So now let's take a step back to answer that question. Where you can see it's a whole process. It's a whole initiatory process that they're going through. And to do, you know, we could study this for a, a very long time, but we're, we're, we're here to answer a specific question. So if you pull back, if you turn around, now if you look towards the west and you pull back, 
what you see is <clears throat> Kunum Hotep and Kunum and Ankh, and they are in sitting before an altar of offerings. And what's happening is that these two, you know, if we if we apply what we've learned, these two images are making a hologram in the center of the room. But before we get there, what is going on that is causing this, 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 what makes this hologram so uh, profound? What is the profundity of the hologram? So let's go here and let's see what's going on. So let's go. And let's see. So this is uh this is Kunum Hitab. Oh Kunum and Ankh. And you're gonna see here on the offering table, you're gonna see what is being off what is being offered is what is being given up. And you see the priests that are making the ritual implements and these are metaphors they're not really slaughtering animals or slaughtering bulls it, this is a, a metaphor of slaughtering your your maleness or your 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 bull aspect you know your 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 generative kind of you're, you're harnessing your generative power uh, and not projecting it out into the world so you're you're sacrificing that so let's look at the offering. So here's the 1,000 beef, the ka, and here's the 1,000 geese, the ape. So giving up the, the, the opposites of maleness and femaleness are being given up. And so if you're giving up your maleness, you know, now, you're, you're, now we're getting into the, the, the deep, profound mystery. You're giving up your maleness. And you can see all the male is being slaughtered. So if you're giving up your maleness, then this can never be a sexual act. There's something else, something more profound is occurring. It, these, the point is that these are spiritual initiates that are going through a mystical process. If you look on the other side, And this side is Kunun Hetep. You can see 1,000 Ka, so 1,000 B. Ka, 1,000 geese is being given up. And again, the bull is being slaughtered. So you're giving up your maleness. So now the maleness has been given up, the femaleness has been given up. So duality has been given up. It is, it's, it's been ritually slaughtered. It's been metaphysically slaughtered as a, based upon this panel, as a spiritual realization that has already occurred. So let's stand here and let's turn around. And let's pull back. Now a hologram is being made by these two. So Kanum Hatev, Kanum and Am are coming together in the center of the room as a hologram. And they are gazing at themselves. So the two has become one in the center of the room. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, two aspects of the same reality that has become a total unit of one. So the divine that they are in the presence of is themselves sitting on the throne in front of the offering, in front of themselves. And they are looking at themselves in this embrace, uh, in the presence of the great divine where the union of opposites and union with the mystery of life has taken place. So they're, they're the divine that they are in the presence of. 
So if you imagine, if you visualize a hologram here, the hologram is looking this way and looking at this process that is being taking place here. And what is happening is that they're breathing in, they're breathing in, uh, on the other side, they're breathing in life force. <clears throat> on this side, you're breathing in the presence of the divine through each other. And so there's only one divine. If you're breathing in the divine of me and I'm breathing in the divine of you, there is only divinity. And that is substantiated here. Now here there are in the, in the furthest west, and this inscription reads, going a little fast, <laughs> says, Suten Adi Bura S Hedge Adi Suten Hank Mird Bird Neb F Kanum Hetep. So now he's the royal. So now they're being referred to as the royal. <clears throat> The royal, polished, cleansed, purified shape in a great house causes the illumination by way of that, that polishing, that cleansing, that shaping. So cleansing, polishing, shaping causes the illumination, which brings forth a deeper polishing and cleansing. So it's the refinement of the awareness of the divine. Royal presented love to the divine, he, Kanum Hetep. So the royal is presenting love, divine love to the divine. So they're no longer, they, they're no longer human. They have realized their own divine nature. What does it say on the other side? says, Suten Adi Bura S Hedge Adi Suten Hank Mur Er Neb F Ank Kunum and Ank. Again, the royal who has been polished in the great house has cause the illumination, which causes a deeper polishing, cleansing, shaping. And that royal offers divine love to the divine, which is he, Kanum and Ang. So they have realized divinity and they're not, no longer seeing or apprehending themselves as human beings in, in the, the, the sense of human beings. So they're seeing the they're not only seeing the divine, they're not only being, they are immersed in that inner divine nature. And these processes, as said before, on the other side, they're breathing in life force. On this side, they're breathing in divinity. So the answer to the question is no, this is not an act of homosexuality. Now, we, we have to, and the reason why that can be, it, this can be misconstrued is looking at these things through a, a cultural context that does not apply. So the, if you look at this through uh, a, a cultural uh, context of African religion, you'll see how it makes sense. And so let's see if we can do that. So we're going to stop here. Um, we are. And now let's go to this video. Let's go to this video. And let's see. Well, What's going on? <clears throat>
and this is a this Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth, episode two, the message of myth. And we're starting at 4641, and it'll go for about three minutes. With all kinds of rules, you can define that sort of thing. And uh, there was a time when a great monster uh, named Rutra. Oops, uh, let's bring it back. Oh, hold one moment. Uh, let's see here. Uh, one moment, please. Uja, uh, it's actually Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth, episode three, the first storytellers. So let's see what is said here. So about three minutes. We had this psychological experience, this traumatic experience, this ecstasy would become the interpreter for others of things not seen. And they would become the interpreters of a heritage of mythological uh, life, you might say, yes. And ecstasy was a part of it very often. Shamanic it is. The trans dance, for example, in the in, in the Bushman society. Now, there's, there's a fantastic uh, example of something. Um, the little Bushman groups. Uh, the whole life is one of great, great tension. Uh, the, the male and female sexes are, uh, what we say, in, in a disciplined way separate. The, the men have a certain field of uh, concerns, their weapons, the poisons of the hunt and all that, and the women have a certain field of concern, the bringing up the children, the nourishing of the children, so forth and so on. Only in the dance do the two come together. And they come together this way. The women sit in a circle or in a group, and uh, they then become the center around which the men dance. And they control the dance and what goes on with the men through their own singing and beating of the thighs. What's the significance of that, that the woman is controlling the dance? Well, the woman is life and the man is the servant of life. And, uh, and during the course of this circling, circling is a very tense style of movement men have, uh, the suddenly that one of them will pass out. It's in trance now, and this is a description of an experience. When people sing, I dance, I enter the earth, 
I go in at a place like a place where people drink water. I travel a long way, very far. When I emerge, I'm already climbing. I'm climbing threads. I climb one and leave it. Then I climb another one, then I leave it, and I climb another. When you arrive at God's place, you make yourself small. You come in small to God's place. You do what you have to do there. Then you return to where everyone is. You come and come and come, and finally you enter your body again. All the people who have stayed behind are waiting for you. They fear you. You enter, enter the earth, and you return to enter the skin of your body. And you say, that is the sound of your return to your body. Then you begin to sing. The Utum masters are there around. They take hold of your head and blow about the sides of your face. This is how. Okay, so you see the intimate connection and you see how the, the officiating priest or the one who's in charge of the ritual is blowing on his face. How you manage to be alive again. Friends, if they don't. Can you see how close their bodies are? So you cannot say that you know, just because their bodies are closed that it's, it's a, you know, a homosexual act or anything like that. Do that to you, you die. You just die and are dead. Friends, this is what it does. This tum that I do, this tum here that I did. This is an actual experience of transit from the earth to through the realm of mythological images to, to God or to the seat of the um, of power. Okay, and now a couple of images to conclude the presentation and to to put the final the final, <laughs> final hammer down. Okay, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint just so you can see. can see, and these are photos that I took. This from the tombs of the nobles in Aswan. You can see a male and a female here. They have their thumbs out like this and their hands near their ears. Uh, you know, I'm not going to give a detail of what is going on here. You know, it's not appropriate, you know. Uh, but suffice to say, they're transmitting life force through certain energy channels of, of the body and the brain and head. So they're, they're transferring life force through their hands. There's a male and a female. And here you have two males doing it. Transferring life force. And here you have Nefertiti with her lips on the lips of her daughter. And actually she's breathing life force into her daughter. So all of this is an exchange of cosmic energy. And over here, you have the young girl who is undressed, unclothed, teenage girl. And she's helping the noble to get dressed and you know, probably putting oils on her, helping her, et cetera. And the, if we're looking at this through a, a cultural context of the time, none of this is unusual. But if you're trying to look at this through a different cultural context and try to impose that cultural context on what is there, then, you know, there can be misunderstanding. So the two, they, they were not manicurists there and the, the pharaoh just sitting there and people polishing his nails and things like that. It's actually, uh, it's an actually an area where boys would go to be initiated into the mystery of the elimination of duality and the mystery of life and the discovery of divine nature. Is where boys would go for, for initiation. They would start young. And we know this because the depictions are there on the wall. We're running out of time. You know, I'll show you next time what I mean by that. And here you have the God Sebek and the Purda in intimate embrace. So are we going to say that this is bestiality? He's about to have sex with a 
a half crocodile, half human being. You no, know, it's, it's a divine embrace. It's a, and this depiction of the crocodile headed man is a metaphor for a principle of divinity. And here you have the, the, the royal, the initiate. You find this in the Luxor temple. These are also pictures that I took where you have the initiate embracing Amun and Amun's penis is touching his navel. And again, this is tantric metaphor. What it means is that he's been ejaculated with the, the spirit of, 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 of hidden consciousness. And that is illuminating his mind to the reality of that hidden consciousness. And then here you have, from the Cairo Museum, you have the initiate and he's in an intimate embrace with Patah. This is the divinity Patah. And this is the initiate and their noses are together. So he's breathing in divinity. And that's what's happening here. It's the same process here. He's, he, he is doing the process with a, a divinity and here they're realizing that they are the divinity. So whatever they can do with Pata, they can do with each other because they are, men and women are, are immortal gods and goddesses. The gods and goddesses are mortal men and women. And if that is truly realized and understood, uh, you will know that you are divinity and the, the other person are divine you know, entities as well. So that, you know, it makes uh, sexism, racism, uh, even homophobia, all of these kinds of things, it makes us stupid. Uh, it, and it's based on ignorance. Uh, people are divine beings. So you have to get out of your race, your, your, your race identity, and you also have to get out of your gender identity. You're, you're not male or, or you're not male or female, and, and you're not transgender or gay. All of it is nonsense. You're not heterosexual, bisexual, or gay. All of it is nonsense. You are divinity. You are one with the supreme divine. And so there's a process of how to discover that supreme divinity. So like was said before, this is the area where the boys, where boys would go to discover divine nature. It has nothing to do with sexuality of any type. It, they, would, they would enter into this place after they have been trained for a while uh, under, so the, the boys will be apprentice priests and apprentice mystics. And then they will come here to do the, the final rituals and practices for the discovery of, of self. So the answer is no. Okay. <laughs> Are there any brief questions before we go? So everything, uh, everything concerning that is speculation. And so we are, you know, we are showing the, the mystic way, you know, that was uh, brought down to us from the, the mystics, the sages of ancient times. Do I no problem? Oh yes, the uh, the whole a couple of slides ago you said that you won't explain because it's inappropriate. What's inappropriate? Uh, yes, the whole process of the the transfer of energies outside the scope of this discussion. That's for you know one of the more higher initiatic courses. Let's say like the Amdua course or the AEM course or something like that. That will discuss those issues in more detail. Okay, anything else? Okay, so Dua, uh, Basu Ola, and uh, 
Sumu Setna has for truncating the program so we can get through this and answer the question definitively and with uh, authenticity and with, with scriptural reference. Okay, do everyone, Pete. That's it. So the ancients used metaphor to express mystical processes of spiritual initiation. Yes, now you've gotten it. <laughs> you've got it. That's that's the uh, yes. That's the answer. Patet, no problem. Uja. Uja. Can I comment on that? Uh, comment? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Mujah, greetings everyone. So, Samaat. so the comment about the ancients used metaphor to express mystical process of spiritual initiation. So what you are illuminating, and I think where people often get confused is how the concept of this tantric mysticism, right? The metaphor of these um, physical forms of what appear to be physical forms of intimacy, you know, are metaphor for a spiritual process. And people get that confused with the sort of physical acts of, you know, two people embracing or even further degraded with sexual acts. So they think tantric sex as opposed to tantric mysticism and don't un, uh, fully appreciate that uh, metaphoric really process and that everything that we are looking at in the images and the iconograph iconography are metaphoric messages and the caution is to not try to impose the sort of physical amystical western uh, analysis so do I have for the next nefer explanation and exudation in truth, I just realized that I wish that this knowledge could be explained to some students here. So she's talking about people in Brazil. <laughs> Tell them come to our classes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that misunderstanding is everywhere, not just where you are. It's everywhere. And so for those who are uh, ready to approach the teaching in its authenticity. And we are here to, to offer them, to give them. Okay, do everyone attend. 